Father, they, they're 168 hours in a week. We set this one hour or so aside just to make it all about you. We want to do our best to please you. We want to do our best to worship you. We want to do our best to exalt you. And we can't do that if we're not in the right frame of mind. We can't do that if we've got a lot of baggage of sin in our hearts and lives. So, Lord, I pray that before we ever begin, that we'll search our hearts and to be for certain that there's no spirit of any kind that would not be pleasing to you. And, Lord, when we finish here today, I pray that if we could look into your face, that we would see a smile on your face because you're pleased with the worship that we offered. And God, will thank you now for all that you'll do. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Now, if you'll stand with me, and we enjoy singing a couple of choruses just to get things going again uh, this morning. It's amazing what praising can do. Now, listen to me, guys, for just a second. I know that we're an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing church. And some of y'all are so uh, dignified, I, and I understand that. I, that's, that's wonderful, okay? Good. But it's okay in a Baptist church to raise your hand. It's okay in a Baptist church to say amen. Now, I'm not trying to get you to do something you don't want to do, but somewhere along the line, some of y'all got to practice for glory, okay? Because when you get to heaven, if you think you're going to sit down and do nothing, you're silly. It ain't going to happen. We're going to shout, have a time in glory. I promise you. They may do some running up there. I don't know. But nonetheless, I hope that you'll join us this morning. Here we go. It's amazing what praise he can do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's amazing what praise he can do. next little course I forgot to say I wanted to say a special thank you to the to the men and ladies that came yesterday to work on our building to clean we do this spring cleaning and fall cleaning y'all did a marvelous job and I mean these ladies around here I, I'd look at them they're they're laying down wiping the marks off the, the, the baseboard and wiping walls down uh, oftentimes people will come in here and they'll ask me say preacher is this a new building to no, know it's 23 years old, but it's, it's, it's taken care of, and we honor God's building, and we do our best to take care of it and such as that. So I just I wanted to say a thank you for y'all that came and, and did so much, and I appreciate it so much, okay? This is a day that the Lord has made. Here we go. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. This is 
Stand with us if you would. We'll continue to sing. 195 in your hymn book if you're using one. Otherwise, we'll put the words on the screen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You sing that with us this morning. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sorry. Turn around and shake hands. I forgot that. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to sing a, a, a choir special for you this morning that talks about uh, the thought of the song is something even I have a difficult time understanding sometimes. And that's this, how God could love me the way that he does, knowing me the way that he does. And uh, all of my sin, past, present, and future, he knows. Yet because I'm covered in the precious blood of Christ, he never brings it up. I'm so thankful for that. This song talks about that. You listen. I've never got over that I am not under the bondage sin anymore. And I'm still amazed. That Jesus would pay a debt I could not afford. I've never got past that I'm free at last from the sin that made me a slave. And I still feel as much as when he first touched me. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed. I'm amazed this stranger would accept a manger in exchange for a kingly throne. And I'm still at a loss why he'd take the cross instead of a street of pure gold. He's the only king who gave everything in exchange for a cold, dark grave. And I still love to ponder this God-given wonder. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. Stand with us one last time, if you would. We'll let our choir be dismissed and our ushers come in and take today's offering. You know, all these songs we talk about are all culminating into one event that's going to happen one day. And uh, that's the day the Lord comes back to take us all home, get us out of this place where we're at now. We're just pilgrims here. We're just passing through. You know, a lot of us have our, our address on our mailbox. That's not where we really live. We know Christ is Savior. Our home's in glory. And I'm looking forward to that one day when he comes back to get us. You sing as our choir goes down. Here we go. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. 
one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt amongst men, he example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, and one day he's come. One day the trumpet will sound of his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away, rising, he justified freely forever, and one day he's come. guys how are you you doing okay is this your first time that I didn't ask I'm not even talking to you you're just like your mama is this your first time to help us you've done it before you sure are pretty uh, these uh, the kids have got what we collect as pocket change many of y'all say well preacher we do that every week well and I understand <laughs> And we've been doing uh, this for, you know, goes towards our building. But we've got a new project we're going to start this morning, okay? And if some of y'all notice as you pulled in this morning, you may have, you may not have, our playground. We are redoing our playground. And uh, in the last week or so, we've had all of the, uh, the equipment, all the stuff painted. And uh, if you'll notice also, uh, we've had a brand new fence put up around it. Uh, Wayne Wright's company uh, put up a fence this past week and uh, look makes it look so nice. And But we're going to add, we've got a large playground. We're wanting to add a couple of, two or three pieces of things that kids can uh, play on. Uh, many of y'all, if you've ever been to a playground, they got those things that uh, got springs, you know, that they rock back and forth. Well, we, we want to buy two or three of those. But those boogers are expensive. This whole thing, I didn't ask you anything yet. <laughs> You're just, what? Monkey bars. Monkey bars. Yes. <laughs> He's your son. <laughs> yeah. I'd look the other way too if I was you. <laughs> How things go this week at your house? <laughs> Y'all? Everything, everything went well? That's okay. It doesn't matter. So anyhow, uh, whatever you put in the uh, kids, uh, what we ask you to do is just set aside your pocket change as you come in at night, uh, lay it aside somewhere, and then on Sunday morning drop it in the basket for the kids. And we use that. Uh, we bought a number of things around this church uh, with pocket change. So if that's what you'd like to do, we'd appreciate it putting in there as soon as we get what we need. We'll add those pieces of equipment, and then we're going to have, uh, it won't be long, we're having some signs made, and we're going to have dedication to that part. We're dedicating it to someone who bought the, the big piece of equipment that's out there, and uh, he's in heaven today. But we'll say more about that a little bit later on. Father, 
Thank you, Lord, for being so good to our church in so many ways, not just financially. But, Lord, we, we want to be wise in what we do with what's yours. It's not ours. We're just stewards. But we want to be smart stewards. We, we don't want to waste one dime. So give us discernment in what we do, and we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Take an offering. We're not only grateful, ask God to meet the needs of our church, but we always like to slow down long enough to thank Him for what He's done. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the offering this morning. God, give us discernment in what we do with it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You know, the world that we live in, we're always faced with multiple levels of different kinds of authority, people who uh, have rule over us in certain ways. Um, and, uh, you know, we, ha we have local and, and, and regional and national leadership. And sometimes those people are referred to, you know, as, uh, you know, we refer to them as the president, uh, as the sheriff, as, as a lot of people who have authority over us. But ultimately, for, if you know Christ is Savior, uh, and, and, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not telling you to ignore all these other people who are in authority over us. But you only have one person who's actually in charge of it, and that's the king of glory, your Savior. Uh, all these other forms of authority one day are going to go away. But we'll always have uh, the king in our lives for all of eternity that we'll have to gratefully live under his authority and, and kingship. That's what this song talks about. You listen uh, this morning. With a song of praise And a heart that is grateful And searching for ways To tell you I'm thankful For all that you are to me And when my soul is troubled You are my peace When I am weak You are my strength others forsake me you are my friend when battles keep raging you're my defense when my heart is broken you are my healer when i needed saving you were my savior i come to worship when i under i see Sometimes I stop and I just think, where would I be if your hand of mercy had not rescued me? Give grace undeserved, unfailing love. You're always just what I need. You are my peace when I am weak. You are my strength when others forsake me. You are my friend when battles keep raging. You're my defense when my heart is troubled. You are my healer when I needed saving. You were my savior when I come to worship. Whenever I sing, you are my king. Lord, you are faithful. Amazing, loving, unchanging. What you've been for others is what you are to me, and always will be. You are my friend.
bread. You are my healer when I needed saving. You were my Savior when I come to worship whenever I sing. You are my King when I come to worship. Whenever I sing, you are my King. Lord, you are my King. God. Thank you all so much. If you have your Bibles, let's go once again to the book of 2 Timothy. As we work our way through this series in Paul's letter to this young preacher, trying all he can to try to encourage him for the times in which he is facing. Chapter number 3. Actually, 2 Timothy chapter 3 might be one of the greatest prophetic chapters you find in all of Scripture. Most of the time when we think of prophecy, we always think of the book of Daniel or maybe the book of the Revelation or Matthew 24 and those kind of chapters where it talks about the tribulation or the millennial reign of Christ and the rapture of the church or the second coming of Christ. And all that's, all that's true and all that's good. But Paul's letter to this young preacher, Timothy, he was trying to prepare him for what he was going to face in the church, not so much the prophetic events around him. And I, to me, it's always encouraging. Uh, I, I do a lot of series, and I always enjoy preaching through a book so that when I get to my next portion of Scripture, y'all won't think I'm picking on somebody in particular. And I'm not. I never do. Uh, but I think it's vitally important for y'all to listen carefully this morning because what Paul is trying to convey to Timothy was going to take place during the time of Timothy. There's no doubt about that. But not only was it going to take place then, but it was certainly going to take place in our day and time. And I'll explain more about that as, as we work our way through this. But I want to say, <laughs> I want to say this at the get-go. And I hope that you'll listen carefully. Some of y'all ain't going to like this. Okay? You just, I know that's not good English, but you just ain't going to like it. You say, well, why, preacher? It's because it's going to nail you. It did me, and I believe that it might some of you. But one of the reasons that we have church is, and one of the reasons that we give altar calls at our church is so that we in our Christian walk and our Christian life can make whatever adjustments that we need to make as we, as we go through this thing called life. As you hear what God's Word has to say. And when you hear what God has to say, you say to yourself, that's not, that's not how I'm living. Or my life is not lining up with what God said. I need to make this adjustment. Yep. No shame in that. That's why we have an altar. No, let me, let me illustrate it a little bit where some of you rednecks would better understand it. Some of y'all that go and listen to uh, stock car racing, uh, I don't watch it, but some of y'all do. And, and that's great, nothing wrong, wrong with it. But y'all know as, as these uh, stock cars go around Atlanta Speedway, there are times, uh, sometimes that, that driver will say, I need to make a pit stop. And he tells the spotter up there in the booth, he said, I need an adjustment on something, whatever it may be. So when they get into the pits, then that, that, that pit crew knows exactly what kind of adjustment that needs to be made so that he can get back out and run the race a little bit better. Altars are designed for adjustments in our lives as Christians. Because as we go through this thing called life, this race of life, there are times that we're going to hear things that we need to adjust and change in our lives. But it's, what if that driver out there that's going around that oval, 
What if that driver says, I know I need to come in, but I kind of like what's going on now. I might be in last place, but I'm comfortable. Don't worry about it. I've got everything under control. And that spotter and that thing says, if you don't get in this pit so that we can make adjustments, you ain't going to have a job. Plain, you know, I know that's not, maybe not the best analogy. But God tries to say to you, you need to make whatever adjustments that you need to make in your life and not to be ashamed of it. It'd be a, it'd be a crying shame if that driver in that car said, I would be ashamed to come in there. They think I made a mistake. No, they're going to think you made a mistake when the race is over and you're last. Okay. So I hope that you'll understand that when you hear what God has to say, that you'll be willing to do whatever, if you need to. Maybe you won't need to, okay? But we're going to look at the first five verses of chapter number three. Paul says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Father, I, I pray for these few minutes that you'll allow us not only to have a heart to receive, but God, you'll give me the ability to say it in such a way that it can be understood. Uh, Lord, my name is at the top of the list on these things that I need to make adjustments in my life. I sure hadn't arrived. And I just pray that we would allow the Spirit of God to be honest with our spirit so that when we walk out of here, we could run the race of life as best we can for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. In these last two chapters, Paul paints a picture basically with words uh, of what the future society is going to be like just prior to Christ's return. You have to understand that the people during the writing of Scripture were always looking for Jesus to come back. Even if you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and begin with verse 13, you'll, you'll pick up and realize that Paul, when he was talking about the rapture of the church, was looking to be a part of that. So they were always looking for Christ's return. But the emphasis is on what is going, what is going to be like in the church itself before Christ comes back. There is going to be what's known as apostasy going on in the church. You say, preacher, what is apostasy? Apostasy is, is uh, people professing to be Christians. People that profess and are in a church but they deny the teaching of the Word of God and what it has to say. They get away from that. They, they start coming up with their own idea of the things and such as that. All you got to do sometimes, guys, is to watch, uh, if you do, is watch some, some, some of these TV preachers. And I'm, I'm not here to judge them. God, God will take care of all that kind of stuff. But when they start talking about that they heard from God, that God spoke to them, that they heard God say something. Then if one of them says that God said something to them, you need to turn that TV off. Because God has said everything God's going to say with this book. God's not going to come out with any kind of new revelation or anything along that line. Okay? My, my point, that was going on in that time, and it's going on in our time, day and time. So we're living in what's referred to as the messianic time, the times between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. It's called the last days, if you'll notice there in verse number one. That's what he's talking about, between his first coming and between his second coming. And Paul gives a description of what the times will be like prior to Christ's second coming. Now, you've got to understand this. Since the time of Christ, Times have been bad. We know that. We understand it. All you got to do is read history. 
But the point that Paul's statement is that times are going to get progressively worse, progressively perilous. That's what the word has the idea there. The word perilous, uh, you find the same word that's only used twice in all of Scripture. It's used again in the book of Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. Where, where Christ was, uh, it was talking about the maniac at Gadara. Listen to what it says. And when he was come to the other side of the country of the Gesserines, there met him two possessed with devils among out, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. Exceedingly fierce is the same word, Greek word, that they, Paul uses there in uh, verse number one, meaning... Uh, 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 when he talks about being fierce, threatening, or dangerous days, times, whatever, whatever how you want to refer to it. But the word times in verse number one uh, is not, it's referring to periods of time. It's not talking about chronological time. You and I think about chronological time. We think about church starting at 1030 and being over at 12. That's chronological time. What what Paul is saying there is not chronological time. He's talking about seasons of time, how things are going to be through certain seasons in history. And that's what he's trying to convey. So let, let me say this again because I think it's so important. The marks of the end times that Paul talks about in these verses are somewhat characteristic of all ages. You're going to see some of it in all ages. doesn't matter when it may be. But let's consider some marks of the last days, marks that not only the world, but also that's going to be taking place within the church itself. Now, if you'll notice how these marks of the last days sound very much like a, a picture of things today. Paul gives 18 characteristics of things that's going to be going on in our day and time. Some of these are going to be in the church some of these are going to be in life. So what, I, what I'd like for you to do, what I want, want you to do, is to look at your own life and see in your own life, this is true. This is what's going on in my life. I wish it wasn't, but it is. I'm glad, that I, I'm glad I heard what the Word of God had to say today so I can make the changes or the adjustments that need to be made. Okay? So I'm just going to go through and we're going to consider these 18 real quick. And you can do with them whatever you want to do. Notice what he says in verse number 2. For men will be lovers of their own selves. Now this doesn't mean that, that the normal and the natural love of life and of oneself that, that we all have. That's, that's not what he's referring to. It means, uh, it means a kind of love that's selfish. It means a kind of love that's self-centered. It means the kind of love that's self-serving. That's the kind of love that Paul talks about. He says this is going to increase as time goes along. Men are going to be more concerned. And when I use the word men, it's a generic term. I'm talking about men and women both. It doesn't have to be just men, okay? So, put, you know, it, it means to focus oneself on one's own pleasure, one's own flesh instead of upon God and, and, and others. It means that life revolves around me. It means it's all about me and it's all about what I want in life, plain and simple. And I don't care how it impacts other people, as long as I get what I want, when I want it, how I want it. That's all I care about. To put oneself, in other words, to put oneself before others. Before husband, before wife, before parent, before child, you know, before God before your relationship with him or anything else. It's putting your will before God's will. It's to seek one's own desire without considering others. It means to go after what we want, even if it's unwise and even if it hurts other people. It's simply about what I want. And to feel that everyone else should, you know, everyone else's life ought to revolve around what I want, you know. Children's needs, you know, I, let, let me illustrate. There's so many in our day and time that, that life revolves around their need, their want, their wishes, 
that uh, it doesn't matter if it takes a child away from church, away from a WANA program we have here, away from anything that exposes them to the Word of God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm not there on Sunday night. It doesn't matter if I'm not there on Wednesday night because I'm going to do what I want to do. That's exactly what he's talking about here. It's about me, and it's about what I want in my life. It just simply means that the last days people will love themselves more than they love anyone else. Number two, people will be covetous. Word means lovers of money and possessions. People will want more and bigger and bigger and bigger and better and better. No matter the cost, no matter the impact, no matter how it impacts other people's lives. I want more. I don't care if I can't afford it. It doesn't make any difference. This is what I want. And bless God, I'm going to get it one way or the other. If you put it in one word, it's the word materialism. I want. Seldom will they be satisfied with what they have. Their eyes and their heart will focus on money and what it can get them and not on God and the importance of a relationship with Him. I've known of people that will sacrifice their children on the altar of desires, of what they want. This is what I want, plain and simple. So in the last days, people who, who can indulge themselves and hoard instead of meeting the needs of, of the poor people. Have you ever in your life, where's Fred at? Fred Balk, is Fred in here? Fred, this is no slant on you. Fred owns a uh, storage company, okay? He's got a, a bunch of storage companies. So this is, I wasn't even thinking about you when I did this. But have you ever seen any more storage companies built than being built in Walton County? Everything new going up is a storage building. You say, wonder why they're doing that. Because in the last days, people will want to hang on to stuff. People want to have a place to put their stuff. And Fred had enough sense, says, I'm going to tap into that and get them fools. <laughs> what I'm going to do. That's the point, guys. That, and that's, that's, that's basically what he's, what he's trying to convey, convey here. Third thing, people will be boasters. He or she is a person who boasts in what he has. Some boasters, you know, they'll pretend to have what they, what they don't have in order to impress people. It'll be a false humility, you know. Uh, if someone who, you know, may brag about a, a possession or an achievement just in order to impress other people, what he's trying to obey. Fourth thing, people will be proud Arrogant, putting themselves above other people. Whatever you may have, you know, done that they, they, they've done better. You ever been around somebody like that? Yeah, I've done that. I did more than that. You know, I had that. I had more than that. And that's exactly what he's trying to convey here. The proud person, you know, may, may appear quiet and humble, but within his heart, he secretly feels like that he's better than others. Again, in verse 2, people will be blasphemers. It's a word which means to insult, to slander, to curse. You know, you can watch TV without hearing someone blaspheme, someone including God. You can't see it anymore. And people don't think a thing in the world about it. Sixth thing, people will be disobedient to parents. It means to disobey or show disrespect. Not to honor parents, no matter our age or their age, it just it doesn't make any difference. If a child will not respect a parent, then they're not going to respect anybody else. They're not going to respect, when they grow older, they're not going to respect a, an employer or an employee. They're not going to respect a, a police officer. They're not going to respect any kind of authority because they grew up not respecting anything. And none of the parents instilled it in them to respect and that's where they're going to learn it, guys. You teach them when they're young to respect saints, to respect people, to respect authority, to respect God, to respect the Word of God, to respect the house of God. You teach them when they're young. You can't wait till they become teenagers. Well, I want them to like me. 
God didn't give you children so they'd like you. You got a lifetime for them to like you later on. Mine didn't like me till he was 21, and it's still kind of questionable. <laughs> but I wasn't called to be his friend. I was called to be his parent. Amen. And it's important that we do that. You say, well, I, 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 I don't agree with that. We'll raise you heathen. If you love them enough, the Bible says you'll correct them. Okay? Seventh thing. I told y'all you wasn't going to like all this. People will be unthankful. No. You people, <laughs> you people from Enterprise, I hope y'all come back sometime when I have a positive <laughs> message. We'll get positive eventually, okay? But we're just kind of working our way through this, this scripture. <laughs> People will be unthankful, no sense of gratitude or appreciation for what others may do for them or give to them, you know. People today feel like that we live in a society where they're entitled to something. If we, God help us if we got what we were entitled to, you know. We, we don't live, you know, we ought to be thankful what, what people do for us. We probably around here, we ought, to, we ought to sing the song a little bit more, Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. God has been so good to us. You know, just the fact that you can roll out of bed and come to church, thank God, praise God Almighty for it. You know, a lot to be thankful for. Thank the Lord for what he does for us. People will be, will be unholy. Verse number two. Be unholy. It means profane, indecent, being blind to, to, to modesty and to purity and godliness. There's a loss of respect and reverence for holy God and the holy Bible and the holy living. Everybody wants to be accepted and fit in no matter the cost. It doesn't make any difference. I want everybody to like Everybody ain't going to like you. It just ain't going to happen. You know, your kids won't even like you. But that's okay, as long as they respect you. It's important. I'm always amazed nowadays, you know, when we talk about being unholy, large companies and large corporations, they'll set standards for their companies. You know, you got to look a certain way, maybe you got to dress a certain way to go call on a clientele and such as that. And companies do that, and companies are successful. But you let a church set some, some sort of a standard, and you'll think you turn hell inside out. What? You're going to tell me what I can wear, what I can't wear? No. No. I'm just trying to tell you how to be holy. I don't tell people what to wear. I wear what my wife tells me to wear. Number nine, verse three, people be without natural affection. Natural affection is affection and love for family and friends and neighbors and co-workers and such as that. But in the end times, people will be set on doing their own thing. So selfish and so self-centered that they'll have little or no affection for anyone or anything. They'll act on every desire and lust that they have whether it's natural or not. You and I cannot act on every desire that we have, guys. You can't do that. Somewhere along the line, you have to pull things in check. Home will be nothing more than in the last days, I believe, than revolving door where people eat, sleep, and change clothes and go on. No family thought. There'll be little affection in the family. Verse 3, number 10, people will be truce breakers. That means breakers of promises and breakers of agreements. Someone who does not keep their word. You say, well, who does that apply to? You remember the commitment that you made when you stood before a preacher or you stood before God or you stood before a justice of the peace and you looked at one another and you made a vow, you made a commitment to one another. That's what he's talking about. 
you know, in our day and time, people think, boy, the, the divorce rate is awful, and it is. But did you know that it's as bad in the church as it is in the world? Same percentage, same identical percentage. Ought not to be. But that's what he's talking about. Number 11, people will be false accusers. In the Greek, that word uh, accusers is the, is the word diabolos. It's the very word where we get the word for Satan as the slanderer. Same word. How many people have been hurt and destroyed by someone who says something that's a lie about them? It doesn't have to be true. I know of a young man, one time rumors started about this young man. He was in school, about middle-aged school. They started a rumor that he was gay. Absolutely almost destroyed that young man. Absolutely. If you can't say something nice and you can't say something encouraging, if you can't say something positive, then shut up. Amen. Just be positive. You say, well, it's not in me. Well, get Jesus in you. You get Jesus in you, I promise you, you'll be able to say what you need to say. Okay? Then people will be incontinent. That word incontinent means no self-control. No power to discipline themselves in areas such as pleasure and indulgences and passions and sexual cravings and lust and lewdness. It's the person who cannot control his passions for food and sex and pornography and drink and smoking or whatever else it might be. It's the passion that has them in bondage. And we all face those at different times in our lives. Verse 3, number 13, people will be fierce. That word fierce means savage, untamed. We're talking about how it's going to be in the end times. You know, you and I nowadays have, uh, we're able to see on the news and because of cameras and because of all that stuff, we're able to see how savage people can be. How they walk up and they just, they just hit an old person just to have something to do. Or they shoot somebody. They're savage. They're untamed. That's exactly what he's talking about. And the times in which we live right now is getting worse and worse and worse. People no longer just murder. They mutilate. They torture. They kill randomly. They take pleasure in what they do. That's the times in which we live. Next, people will be despisers of those who are good. It speaks of people who will not stand up or speak up for what's right and for what's good. It talks about people who, who wants to fit into the world and be accepted by the world no matter what the cost might be. I know, and I'm sure that y'all do too, parents... There are parents that will put their children on the sacrifice of success so that they can tell how, how well their child does in something. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how far a child can hit a ball, how many times he can throw it through a basket, or whatever else it might be if that child dies and goes to hell. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they don't have an opportunity to invest their life in God's purpose for their life. It doesn't matter. It's our responsibility as parents and as a church to try to love them to Jesus. People will be despisers of those who are good. Again, people will be a traitor, spiritually speaking. It's the person who turns his back on Christ and the church and returns to the world and all that the world's got to offer. There's not a church in existence today that that hasn't happened. We've been at this church long enough. We started this church in the living room almost 28 years ago. We could have filled these blue seats up a number of times for the people that's come through here. And you see they're still empty blue seats. You say, where are they? They're out there. 
Now, I'm not saying there may be some move. There may be some that's gone to other churches that's involved. I understand that. But I could stand here and give you names of those that say, no, we're more interested in what the world's got to offer. I don't care if I had to put my child on the sacrifice of success as long as they get the recognition. God help us one day when we see that great white throne judgment. People will be heady. It means headstrong and reckless. They give no regard to the consequences of their actions. Let me say something. I hope that you'll listen very carefully. Every choice and every action in life has a reaction and has a consequence. I don't care who you are. Whatever choice you make in life, and we make them every day in our life, but whatever choice we make in life has a consequence. Most of the time, people don't think about the consequences that they're going to face when they make some choices in their life. We're all guilty of that. Verse 4, people will be high-minded. This person is, a, is full of themselves. He feels no need for God. He is his own man. Any kind of relationship with God has no priority in his life whatsoever. Then lastly, last one, verse 4, people will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now think about this. The average church member today does not allow the church service to come between him and his pleasure. You know, not long ago, our faithfulness to the house of God was central in our activities and in our thinking. Nowadays, our activities outside the house of God and the church attendance takes precedent over our commitment to God. As long as it doesn't interfere with what we want to do, and the activities that we want to be involved in, we'll be there, preacher. But me and my family, we don't necessarily need Sunday night. I, I, don't, I don't need to come and hear the Word of God and what it's got to say. I don't need to know about how I can lead my family. I don't need to know about that stuff on Sunday night. I don't need my children to be involved in the water program on Wednesday night. What good does it do for them to memorize God's Word? Why do I need all that? I got things that I can do. I work hard all day. I, 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 I. It's all about I. And then when the kids grow up, 14, 15, 16, 18 years old, have no desire for God. Well, they grow up and they'll say, well, it wasn't important to mom and dad. Why should it be important to me? Verse 5, and I'm through. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. The word form there means an outward form or kind of like an outward shell. But just like the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes who were rotten to the core is what he's talking about there. A preacher of bygone days, probably maybe 50 years ago, his name was Oliver B. Green. He used to be a great preacher on the radio. He made this statement, and I quote, This is the age of pleasure-loving pleasure church members going through forms and rituals on Sunday, then hanging their religion in the closet along with their Sunday suit until next Sunday. They have a form of worship, but they deny the power of God, and they deny the supernatural, and they deny a living reality in relationship with God. Paul knew, as he wrote this to this young preacher, Paul knew that as times grew, that these characteristics would be more prevalent. And the sad thing is that there are not a lot of differences from the world that we live in and the churches that we attend. Please listen carefully, and I'm through. Don't be fooled by a counterfeit relationship with Christ. That's the reason Paul, 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I believe it's verse number 5, Paul says, examine yourselves to be whether or not you're in the faith. L listen to me, guys. When we have a personal relationship with Christ, things in our lives are going to change. Something will change. I'm not saying everybody's going to change the same. I understand that. But somewhere along the line, there's going to be a spirit of, 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 of Christ-likeness. There's going to be a desire to produce fruit in your life. There's going to be a desire to, to be Christ-like. There's going to be a desire to love the brethren. Paul talks about all these things. Scripture talks about all these things that's going to be true in our life. And one of the big things is simply this. There's going to be a desire to obey the Word of God. And you'll never obey the Word of God until you have a relationship with the Word of God. So don't sit there in those blue seats and say, well, everything's all right with me, but I don't have time for God's Word. That would be like me saying in my marriage relationship, well, everything's fine with my marriage relationship, but I don't have time for her. I'm not even going to go home to her. I, I got other places to go. I got other places to go. I've been good today. I, I'm going to get lunch today. Right? Lord, thank you. You know, but, but if I didn't have, you know, I've been working on this marriage for 55 years last week. 55 years we've been working on this thing. And if I were to tell her today, you know, I, I'm going to trade you in. I need to use a different illustration. Okay. Anyhow, y'all understand my point. If you've got a relationship with Christ, it's going to show up. Okay. It's just, it's just going to show. It's going to show by your obedience. It's going to show by the fruit that you bear. It's going to, it's, it's going to show by your love for, for other believers. And guys, I pray as we go through all these 18 characteristics that if you saw something that, that need to be the least bit adjusted, don't waste your life when you stand before God someday and God said, I sent a preacher to you one Sunday morning. I, God said, I remember, it was, it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was March of, uh, and March 26th. I sent him there to preach that message, and you could have invested your life, and, and you could have clipped coupons for all eternity, but you turned your back on what I sent. Don't do that. Number one, know that you know Christ is Savior. Without a doubt. Don't, don't walk out of these doors and say, well, I hope so. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect, but I am saying we're going to be forgiven. Thank God for that. Father, Lord, I know that this is not the most positive message, but I didn't write the book. I just know that as, as I work my way through this book that it was there. And I just pray, Lord, that, that this morning that as believers that we'll look at our lives and see if there's any adjustments that we need to make the slightest bit can make all the difference in the world. We won't come to this altar stating the fact that I, that I love me more than anything else. We just say, Lord, I, I need to make some adjustments. I care about my family. I care about my children. I care about my grandchildren. I don't want there to be anything in my life that would be a hindrance in them coming to Christ. I want to invest my life wisely. God, give me the grace, the power, the unction that I need to do and be what you want me to do and be. And Father, I pray most of all, if there is the individual in this room that's got a question mark on their salvation, Lord, please help them this morning to resolve that. And God, I, I just pray that you'd work in mom's and dad's life and let them see the importance of paying the price now to do all they can while they can in the life of their children. 
because there'll come a time when they can't. And we'll thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.